Christ, suffering at the hands of Rome, because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Frass, guest hosting for Walt. And we'll continue our reading and discussion of the most magnificent Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. As is our custom, when I remember, <laughs> we'll have one hour of reading and then an hour of discussion. And I hope you'll find the, the, the reading tonight in, inspiring and will cause you to do more investigation into these particular subjects yourself. It's one thing to listen to a man read a book. It's quite another to read this book for yourself and to follow all of the writings. Uh, do your own research into the writings that Henry Grattan Guinness puts forward as examples of what the Protestant reformers believed regarding the interpretation of the prophecies of Antichrist. What did the Protestant reformers believe? And you will find from their own writings, if you'll take the time and follow their writings, there many of them are, are still available even on the Internet, and you can read them for yourselves and what you will discover. Each and every one of them believe the same thing, that the papacy fulfilled every single one of the prophecies in the Bible regarding the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist of the Bible. And then, of course, after reading all of those works, coming to the same conclusion yourself by the multitude of proofs given by every one of these authors, the question you must ask yourself is, why is this not taught from the pulpits of our churches today? Why is this not a matter of common conversation among the Christians of this world why is this information hidden from us, and for what purpose? Now, we, last time we concluded on page 230 in the book, if you're following along in the online version, and I'm going to repeat, uh, as is my custom, I'm going to retreat a few paragraphs for continuity purposes, and you can follow along. I'll begin in the first or rather the last full paragraph on page 228. And as admonished by the, uh, a listener last week, I'll try to make it clear when I stop the reading of the book and then begin to make my own comments. 
so as not to confuse anyone, uh, especially for those who are not following along, uh, on, uh, reading for themselves in the online version and are simply just listening to me read and uh, make comments. It's a little difficult for them to know when I have departed from the writing and then am making my own comments. So I'll try to be mindful to make a, a clear distinction uh, between the writing and my own comments. All right. The last full paragraph on page 228, Henry Grattan Guinness, the author of this book, it says this. Take first the case of the reformer Luther. I'm speaking of Martin Luther here. He says, early in the year 1520, he, meaning Luther, wrote to Spalatinus thus, quote, these are the words of Luther in a letter to Spalatinus. Here's what he says, quote, I am extremely distressed in my mind. I have not much doubt, but the Pope is the real Antichrist. The lives and conversation, in other words, the lives and the manner of life of the popes, their actions, their decrees, all agree most wonderfully to the descriptions of him in Holy Writ, unquote. So Martin Luther is saying in clear terms that just simply by examining the lives and the manner of, of the popes throughout the history, throughout history, judging by their actions and by their decrees and everything about them agrees most wonderfully, most perfectly to the descriptions of Antichrist in the Holy Bible. That's what he's saying. This is Martin Luther speaking, the Protestant reformer, a Roman Catholic monk up to this point, loyal to the papacy, loyal to the Roman Catholic Church, believed the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, but Martin Luther was in the business of translating the scriptures from Latin into, into the common language, the German language. Martin Luther, for the first time in his life, was becoming familiar with the scriptures. And he saw in those scriptures clearly the description of none other than the papacy. And it revolution, revolu, uh, was a revolution in his life, and not only a revolution in Martin Luther's life, but every other Protestant reformer, and so much so that they rose up against the governments that were put in power by the papacy, they rose up against their own national governments and overthrew them because they knew that the governments of their several nations were answering to the Pope instead of to the people. And the, if the Pope was the Antichrist, they didn't want their kings and queens and princes ruling over them under the direction of the Antichrist of Scripture. So Europe was in revolt against the governments of Europe because they had finally comprehended that it was the papacy who fulfilled all the prophecies in Scripture regarding Antichrist. So Rome was in upheaval. Uh, the, the, all of Europe was in upheaval. And the papacy was finally found out for what it is. Okay? Now, continue at the top of page 229, Henry says, In the autumn of the same year, he, Martin Luther, printed a treatise on the Babylonish captivity of the church. The Babylonish captivity of the church. You can go to any search engine, type in Babylonish captivity of the church, and read for yourself Martin Luther's work, where he declares that Rome is Babylon of the Scripture, that the papacy is the Antichrist and has the whole Christian world held in captivity. All right? He proclaims the papacy to be the modern-day Pharaoh and that he's suppressing true Christianity 
And not only that, but usurping the rightful throne of Christ over the church. Now, he continues, he says, such was the title. In this, he exposed the imposture of indulgences. All right. Now, I'm going to comment. Indulgences were a means that the papacy used to raise money for the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It was under construction at that time. It was incalculably expensive. And the Vatican had to raise money. So, doing what it always does, it uses simony, that is, the selling of ecclesiastical or spiritual uh, power, spiritual benefits, for money. So the papacy was literally saying, by the selling of these indulgences, if you will give us so much money, we will forgive your sins for so long a time. And it came obvious to anyone who who had any common sense or any sense of morality whatsoever to realize that this was an imposture. This was phony. This was fake. And not only that, it was extremely unholy that the papacy would forgive sins for money? Is God a cash register? Okay. So there was an uproar, and Martin Luther disdained this idea of the sale of indulgences to the degree that he was ready to go to war with the papacy all over it. This is not Christ. Christ died on the cross for our sins. Who has the power to sell for money the forgiveness of sins when Christ freely went to the cross to die for us all? Okay? Now, he he continues, he says, In this he exposed the imposture of indulgences. He showed that their object is to rob men of money by the perversion of the gospel. In this animated production... Luther called the papacy, quote, the kingdom of Babylon, unquote. Meanwhile, Antichrist Pope Leo X, I've added the word Antichrist, you won't find it in the text, but nonetheless, it is Antichrist Pope Leo X published his famous damnatory bull against Martin Luther, containing extracts from his works, and forbidding all persons to read his writings on pain of excommunication. All right? So we have the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the current pope at that time, Pope Leo X, published a bull. And now, if most people don't know anything about the Roman Catholic Church, I will tell you that a bull is the most powerful form of writing or expression that a pope can utter. It is a papal bull written and signed and sealed by a pope. It's like the voice of Almighty God. It's irreformable. In other words, it can't be rescinded. Now, this pope, Pope Leo X, because Martin Luther called the Roman Catholic Church or the kingdom of the popes the kingdom of Babylon, this pope issued this most famous damnatory bull against Martin Luther, including in the text certain extracts from Martin Luther's writings, and therefore forbid any person to read his writings on pain of excommunication. Now, for those who don't know what excommunication is, Excommunication from the Roman Catholic Church means you have been set outside of the the grace of the Pope. You have been set outside the church and thereby denied any access whatsoever to God. Okay? Because in the Roman Catholic Church, your access to God is only through the church only through the papacy. 
Excommunication to a Roman Catholic means that you have been damned. Okay? That you have no hope of salvation. That's what excommunication means to a Roman Catholic. Now, Pope Leo X published his damning bull against Martin Luther, containing extracts from Luther's works, and forbid every person to read his writings on pain of excommunication, commanding those who possessed his works to burn them, excommunicating Martin Luther as an obstinate heretic. In other words, you could be labeled by the Pope as a heretic, but at that point you would have a chance to go to recant your misbeliefs and then be restored to full fellowship in the Roman Catholic Church. But if the papacy denominates you an obstinate heretic, that means you are irreformable. You are a heretic forever, and therefore ipso facto excommunicated from the church. In other words, automatically excommunicated from the church. In other words, your sentence has been forever declared. Once you are declared an obstinate heretic. You are simply, well, the Vatican simply washes its hands of you and permanently damns you without any hope of reconciliation. So this Pope, this Antichrist, excommunicated Martin Luther as an obstinate heretic delivered to Satan for the destruction of his flesh and commanding all secular princes, that is, all the governments of Europe, commanding all secular princes under pain of incurring the same censures, that is, permanent damnation, and forfeiting all their dignities to seize his person that he might be punished as his crimes deserved. So the papacy notified all the kings of Europe that if you do not want to suffer the same permanent excommunication and damnation of Martin Luther, then I charge you to find Martin Luther, bring him into captivity, seize his person, and then bring him to Rome so he can be tried and publicly damned, all right, to receive of the crimes that he so rightly deserves. Now, you must know that this Pope, Leo X, would have publicly burned Martin Luther at the stake and held court his, himself over the, the, the burning of Martin Luther. Rome's fangs are dripping with blood. She's tasting blood, and she wants Martin Luther's hide hung on a stick and burn him alive right in front to make an example of all Christendom what happens to those who have the, the gall to refer to the Roman Catholic Church as Babylon and to refer to the popes, the vicars of Christ, as Antichrist? Okay? In other words, all hell is coming down on Martin Luther. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be so fearful if the President of the United States himself launched a campaign, a, 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 a search party to locate you here in this country and bring you to Washington, D.C. for trial. That would be a piece of cake compared to the Pope issuing a, a threat of excommunication to all the princes of Europe and charging them with the responsibility of seizing Martin Luther, bringing him to the Vatican, to be publicly burned. This is the pressure that Martin Luther was under for taking the stand that he took, a stand that every Protestant reformer took, a stand that the Waldenses took, the Albigensians took, the Huguenots took, the Hussites took, and every true Bible believer all the way back to apostolic times. Every one of them suffered the same fate. The papacy announced excommunication and damnation and charged the kings of Europe 
to seize them, to make war against them until they were completely annihilated. And even in the case uh, of some, their histories, even the histories of these people, were sought and burned. Any books, any writings, anything at all that the papacy found were, were confiscated and burned by the papacy so that history would have no record of these people. This is what Martin Luther's up against. Now, he says in October of the same year, Martin Luther wrote to Spilatinus, quote, at last the Roman bull is come, and Echius is the bearer of it. I treat it with contempt. You see that the express doctrines of Christ himself are here in this bull condemned. I feel myself now more at liberty being assured that the popedom is anti-Christian and the seat of Satan, unquote. Let me read it again. This is proof that Martin Luther now more than ever before is finally and irretrievably convinced that the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. He says, I feel myself now more at liberty, being assured being assured that the popedom is anti-Christian and the seat of Satan, unquote. The, Martin Luther has just called the Pope Antichrist, and he's now more assured than ever that it's true. Now it says in, in excuse me, rather December 1st, he, Martin Luther, published two tracts in answer to the papal bull, one of which was entitled Martin Luther Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist, unquote. That's the title of his writing. Listen to it. Martin Luther Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist, unquote. Now, if you've just had the pronouncement of excommunication and eternal damnation from the Pope in a papal bull, no less, a bull that was published all over Europe, and every king and queen and prince and potentate of Europe was now licensed to seize you at whatever cost and deliver you to the papacy to be executed. Martin Luther didn't run and hide. He published a work entitled Martin Luther Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist, unquote. Now, in its conclusion, he admonishes the Pope and his cardinals no longer to persevere in madness. In madness, he calls them mad, right? Here's what he said, quote, no longer to act the undoubted part of Antichrist of the Scriptures, unquote. Martin Luther is calling the papacy and all of his scarlet-clad uh, uh, cardinals Antichrist and admonishes them no longer to act the part of Antichrist. Now, you have to admit that this could be described as nothing but holy boldness for a man whose life had just passed before his very eyes, finding his name in a papal bull, denounced as an obstinate heretic and put upon the charge of excommunication and eternal damnation, knowing that he is a fugitive from every power of Europe Instead of running and hiding, he denounces the papacy as antichrist, including his cardinals, and, be, and, and admonishing them to stop acting the fool that they are. Where's that kind of holy boldness today? To call antichrist what he is, without apology. Christians today don't even know who antichrist is some say it's barack obama some say it well well it was it was john f kennedy 
or Osama bin Laden or any of a number of different potentialities, not a one of them fulfills a single prophecy of the Bible regarding Antichrist. But the papacy, on the other hand, fulfills every single one of them to the letter. Perfection. Perfect fulfillment of the scriptures. And all of Christendom today wonders who the Antichrist will be when he's been with us all along. And all of Protestant history, at least up until the last three or four generations, preached from their pulpits that the papacy was the Antichrist. And all of the of the statements of faith, the official uh, uh, statements of faith of these Protestant churches in their own fashion, in their own language, said the same thing, that the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture, and then gave proofs. Did anybody ever tell you this? You must ask yourself why. Information so important, and you've never heard it from a pastor in any church that you've ever attended in your life. He continues, he says, on December 10th in the same year of 1520, Martin Luther called together the professors and students in the town of Wittenberg and publicly burned the papal bull. More holy boldness, right? He publicly burned the paper bowl in front of the professors and the students of the college at Wittenberg, Germany. And he says, along with it, he burned the canon law, the decretals. You've heard me talk about the pseudo Isidorian decretals. This is a collection a fictitious collection of all the bulls, all the statements, all the declarations, all the definitions, the the created history of the papacy, and every word that was ever uttered according to these decretals, ex cathedra, they became part of the canon law, the decretals, the clementines, and the extravagance of the popes. In other words, all the papal writings. Martin Luther burned the papal bull and the entirety of the Roman Catholic canon law. Now, from the papacy, there is no greater assault upon the seat of Christ, the papacy, than to burn a papal bull, call the Pope Antichrist, call the Roman Catholic Church the Scarlet Harlot, to burn the Roman Catholic canon law, and all of its decretals, its clementines, and even the, the extravagance of the popes. Martin Luther went way overboard. Martin Luther made a point, a point that every one of the Protestant reformers made. They made it in writing. They made it repeatedly. And were they alive today, they would make the same points. But we're ignorant. In our generation, we are completely ignorant of our Protestant history. Barely a handful of us in this country could even tell you what the Protestant reformers were protesting. They don't even know where the word got its name, where the Protestants got their name. They were Protestants because they protested the Antichrist of Scripture, the papacy. Now you know why they called themselves Protestants. You've got to ask yourself again, why was this never explained to me from the pulpit of any so-called Protestant church? Returning to the writing, Henry Grattan Guinness says, the die was now cast. Luther had declared war against the Roman pontiff. Let me read it again. Martin Luther had declared war against the Roman pontiff. Are are you and I at war with the pontiff? Well, I'll let you decide for yourself whether you're at war with the pontiff, but I'll here tell you right now. 
I am at war with the pontiff, and I will remain at war with the Antichrist until Christ returns or he calls me home. There are too many people, not only in this country, but around the world, that are completely ignorant as to who the papacy is and what prophetic role he plays in the world, not just in the old world order, but in the new world order today. And it's the same role he plays today that he played in the Old Testament. And anybody, or in the old world order, and anybody who speaks out against the papacy has the mark of Christ on him and has a death warrant out against him from the papacy. But that didn't stop Martin Luther. He declared war against the Roman pontiff. He had, quote, boldly denominated the Pope the man of sin and exhorted all Christian princes, that is, all the governments of Europe under the Pope's, under the Pope's control, he exhorted all Christian princes to shake off the Pope's usurpations, unquote. He commanded, it would be just like I wrote a letter to the Congress, to the President of the United States, to the Supreme Court of the United States, all of Washington, D.C., to cast off from you any stain of Roman Catholic papal authority. That's what Martin Luther did. He exhorted all. All Christian princes of Europe to shake off the Pope's usurpations. Now, you, you, you've never heard of holy boldness like this. You've never heard of it. I mean, we, we've heard of Moses writing to the Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world at the time, let my people go. But Martin Luther wrote to the most powerful man in the world at his time, not only that, but all the kings and the princes of Europe under papal control, which was literally all of the governments of Europe, and said, let my people go. Let my people go and cast off this usurper in Rome. But who would utter a thing like that today? Most people, you'd, you would say, you know, I told the President of the United States to throw off the usurpations of the Pope. They'd look at you like you were a madman. That's just how little we comprehend what's really going on in the world today. Not a clue. Not even a clue of what's going on in Washington, D.C. today. Luther had declared war against the pontiff. He had boldly denominated him the man of sin and exhorted all Christian princes to shake off his usurpations. In this manner was the Protestant Reformation inaugurated. That's how it began. You know how it's going to end? This author just told you how the Protestant Reformation began. Do you want me to tell you how it ends? Rather, would you like to hear me tell you what the, how the Bible says it's going to end? It says he will destroy him with the brightness of his coming, and by the spirit of his mouth. And I've got to ask you the question. The Protestant Reformation put the papacy on the ropes. It nearly destroyed the papacy. Everyone during the time of the Protestant Reformation and afterwards in Europe believed that the Pope was the Antichrist, 
the Roman Catholic people left the Roman Catholic Church in droves and joined the Protestant Reformation, finally got to know Jesus Christ personally, knew for the first time in their lives what salvation was. They unifiedly denounced all the papal governments of Europe and overthrew them and put their own kings and princes in charge. But who would have the gumption today? Why wouldn't the papacy ever be threatened in our generation? Why couldn't we have another Protestant Reformation today where everyone all of a sudden realized the Pope is the Antichrist? Overthrow our governments. Put godly men, Protestant men in the White House, Protestant men in the Congress, Protestant men in the in the Supreme Court. Break down the walls of Washington, D.C. and make it serve Christ and serve the people whom Christ liberated. That's not going to happen today. You know what's going to be the salvation of God's people? Those who will not stand up to the governments of men and proclaim Christ the King and this his kingdom, it's going to take Christ himself to do it. Christ is going to have to do it because God's people today just don't have the gumption. They don't have the gumption to demand that all the kings of the world shake off the Pope's usurpations. There's no second Protestant Reformation in the offing because the Scripture plainly tells us that Christ will destroy him with the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. You know, it makes me feel like a loser. Martin Luther declared single-handedly, declared war against the papacy. You talk about a single combat warrior. That's what, Ma- that's what Martin Luther was, a David against Goliath. David never had it so good. Martin Luther was up against what would make Goliath look like a, a peanut. But Martin Luther was going all the way. He feared nothing. He certainly didn't fear for his own life. Would to God that there were some Martin Luthers in our day today and stop this new world order. But it's not going to happen. Christ is going to have to do it. There's no gumption in God's house anymore. We're all apostate cowards. We've sown to the wind, and we're going to reap the whirlwind. It's a hideous reality. Israel never thought to be as apostate as modern-day Christianity is today. We could sit back and we could see all the crimes that Israel committed against their own God and Savior, but we can't comprehend our own. And there's a reckoning to pay. And we're going to pay it. We're going to pay it with our own blood. We're going to find out what it's like to be in the Babylonian captivity. We're making bacon with the Pope of Rome through this ecumenical movement. We allow the bishops of, 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 of the Roman Catholic Church to dictate to our government what the laws of this country should be. We've wholly given over this country lock, stock, and barrel to the Antichrist of the Bible. And everybody says, well, the United States is the greatest nation that ever was upon the face of the earth. What delusion. Never was there a greater delusion in world history than there is among God's people in the United States of America You can't get more deluded than the Christians of America today. We've got a whole lot of repenting to do and not much time because Rome is ready to lop off our heads just as soon as the coast is clear. 
We just told you, Mark, uh, Henry Grattan Guinness has just told you how the Protestant Reformation began. The inauguration of the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther damned the papacy as Antichrist, damned his popes or his cardinals, damned the church, proclaimed them all to be Antichrist, that Rome was Babylon, the scarlet harlot was the Roman Catholic Church. He burned the papal bull. He burned the Roman Catholic canon law. He liberated the whole of Europe from the grips of the Antichrist of the Bible. That's how it began. See anything like that today? Guinness continues, he says, in order to justify his action, Martin Luther selected 30 articles from the Code of Canon Law as illustrating the contents of the books he had consumed. In other words, all the books that he consumed by fire, all the Roman Catholic canon law, all the decretals of the popes, the whole kit and caboodle went up in flames in front of the most affluent witnesses the faculty and staff and students of the Wittenberg College. But he saved out 30 articles from those canon laws just to make an example, just to show the people what he had burned. He says, these he printed with pointed remarks, calling on the people to use their own judgment with reference to them. That's right. He was just like Moses. You take a look at this. And you make up your own mind. Martin Luther was so certain that once read by the people the, out of the canon law that they would come to the same conclusion that he did and that they would exonerate him from burning the Roman Catholic canon law and from burning the papal bull and calling the Pope Antichrist. Martin Luther wasn't afraid to share his belief and the proofs right out of the Roman Catholic canon law that he was right. And he knew that it was so copious, so believable, that the people would see it for themselves. Martin Luther believed he took no risk in showing the people why he burned the canon law, why he burned the papal bull. He took no risk that the people might say that he burned God's law, that he violated the legitimate authority of Christ on the earth, the Pope. He took no risk. You understand what I'm saying? He knew common sense would prevail, and the people would see just as clearly as he did what the canon law really says, what it really represents. An imposture, a phony thing, usurping the rightful throne of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther didn't hide the canon law from the people. He didn't hide any of it. He took just 30 pieces of that diabolical document and showed the people as proof enough, knowing full well that they would accept his decree, the Pope is the Antichrist. He sums up by saying that on comparing the different parts of the canon law, its language simply amounts to this, quote, that the Pope is God on earth above all that is earthly, temporal and spiritual, that all things belong to the Pope, and that no one must venture to say, to the Pope, what doest thou? Unquote. That's what the canon law says. That the Pope is, as it were, Christ on the earth, that the earth is his and the fullness thereof, and no one even has the authority to ask the Pope what he's doing. Now, neither one, you nor I, would ask Jesus, what are you doing? I mean, we would all choke before we got the words out, right? 
That's exactly the way the papacy expected every man, woman, and child on the planet during his reign to treat him. Don't you dare ask me what I'm doing. I am Christ on this earth. And that's what the Roman Catholic canon law asserts. And that's why Martin Luther burned it. And saving out only 30 articles, just 30 of volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of decrees of the popes, he saved out just 30 articles. Here, you read this and you make up your own mind and then you'll agree with me that this is not the seat of Christ on the earth. This is the seat of Satan himself. And they did. And they came to the same conclusion that Martin Luther. Could they have all been wrong? Could Martin Luther have been wrong? Could all of Europe have been wrong? Today, the whole world wonders after the beast. Are you beginning to comprehend the level of apostasy in our generation? Are you beginning to get just a glimpse of the level of apostasy in the God's house today? Dennis continues, he says, now remember, he's giving a lecture. He's holding up another book. He's just like Tom, you know, got a whole library of books, only they're not in a bookshelf here like they are in my, in my little office here. No, he brought them to the lecture. He hauled them in. You must believe he he had a wagon of books, a wagon load of books. He's holding up another one. He says, here is an old black letter copy of Luther's commentary on the epistle of Galatians. Under the expression in the second verse, quote, the churches of Galatia, he said, wheresoever the substance of the holy sacraments remaineth, there is the holy church. Although Antichrist there reigns, who, as the scripture witnesseth, sitteth not in a stable of fiends, or in a swine sty, or in a company of infidels, but in the highest and holiest place of all, namely in the temple of God, unquote. You know who Martin Luther was addressing at this point? Those like the Christians of today who erroneously believe the Antichrist will be flaming red in color, will have two horns on his head and a, and a spike on his tail, and he'll be carrying a pitchfork, and he'll be damning Christ everywhere he goes. No, Antichrist is just as subtle as Satan, who deceived Adam and Eve and who has deceived every man and woman and child throughout the history of the existence of this creation. He's right there in the holy temple of God, claiming to be God himself. And he is so subtle that the whole world wonders at. Satan the serpent who beguiled Eve was not dressed in red, did not have two horns, did not have a spike on his tail, was not carrying a pitchfork. No, he deceived Adam and Eve. Well, Satan and his vicar on earth, the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, is just as subtle. He says... Here is an old black letter copy of Luther's commentary on the Epistle of Galatians. Under the expression in the second verse, quote, the churches of Galatia, he says, wheresoever the substance of the holy sacraments remaineth, there is the holy church. Although Antichrist there reigns, who as the scripture witnesses sitteth not in a stable of fiends, or in a swine sty, or in a a company of infidels, but in the highest and holiest place of all, namely in the temple of God, unquote. 
Where would we expect to find Satan if he wanted to destroy God's people? Where would we expect to find him? In a flaming pit somewhere? Or right in the pulpit of your church? Well, Antichrist, throughout all of his history, has deceived the world to believe that he's the vicar of Christ, and he preaches Christ, doesn't he? Yeah. Preaches that he is in the place of Christ, too, doesn't he? Therefore, he is against Christ. Pretending to be a friend of Christ, he is Christ's mortal enemy. So subtle that he has deceived the whole world. And nowhere more deceived than right in the Protestant churches of this country. Well, you say your Protestant church isn't deceived? Then answer me one question. Why has never in your life has your Protestant pastor ever even hinted that the Pope is the Antichrist of the Bible? Why has he never pointed out the papacy's usurpations? Why has he never pointed out the diabolical history, the bloody history of the popes and their crusades? And why have they never talked about the martyrs of Jesus, who by the hundreds of millions over the last 2,000 years have died at the hands of the popes and at the hands of the armies of the nations of the world who sought to destroy God's people? to the very last man. Why is your pope? Why has your pastor never told you about any of this? Why has he never recommended that you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Why has he never recommended that you read Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness? Because there's not one single drop of Protestant blood coursing through his veins. And if he's not a Protestant, he must be a papist. Guinness continues again. He explains, quote, is, this, is not this to sit in the temple of God, to profess himself to be ruler in the whole church? What is the temple of God? Is it stones and wood? Did not Paul say, the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are? To sit. What is it to sit but to reign, to teach, and to judge? Who from the beginning of the church has dared to call himself master of the whole church, but the Pope alone? You see how sure Martin Luther was that the Pope was the Antichrist? Here are the proofs. He sits in the temple of God, professing himself to be God and ruler of the entire church, but he's just a man. Where is the temple of God but in each and every believer? Only Christ can sit in that temple. Unless, of course, a man erects an idol in that holy temple of God and call him the Pope. Who from the beginning of the church has dared to call himself master of the whole church but the Pope of Rome alone? Listen carefully to what Martin Luther is telling you. There is only one candidate. There is only one possibility, one single possibility in the whole existence of creation. There is only one possibility for Antichrist. There's not another that even comes close. I don't mean to sound redundant, but I've said so many times on the program God made it so easy, like falling off a rock to, describe, to discover who the Messiah was. 
I mean, the whole the whole Old Testament is full of the language that Christ would use, even on the even on the, while he hung on the cross. And you have to ask yourself, how did the Jew, how did the Jews miss him? It's too obvious throughout the scriptures who Jesus was. But the Christians today will tell you when you talk about Antichrist, well, we're not supposed to know who he is. Well, he won't come to the last seven years before Christ's return. We don't have to worry about him. Why would God be so careful to make sure that his people could positively identify who the man of who the, who the Messiah was, and yet be so treacherous with the people for whom he died that he would leave a question as to who the Antichrist is. Is, is God a deceiver? He so anxiously wants us to meet his son, yet he keeps it a secret who the Antichrist is trying to trip us up. Well, there was nobody tripped up during the Protestant Reformation. They all agree that it's just as obvious who the Antichrist is as who the Messiah is. God is not playing fast and loose with the souls of the lives for whom his son died. And you simply, again, have to ask yourself, why is this common sense knowledge so rare in God's house today? How could we not know who the Antichrist is? How could we not know how much power and authority the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican has, not just on our foreign affairs, but our domestic affairs. Did did the Pope change, or rather, did God change the Antichrist from the time of the Protestant Reformation till now? No. He's still the same one, and he's still in the business of subtlety preaching Christ out of one side of his mouth and declaring that he is Christ's vicar out of the other. Claiming that we all need to come to Christ out of one side of his mouth and that he is Christ out of the other side of his mouth. Teaching us that we ought to pray to Mary because she is a co-redemptrix and co-mediatrix between earth and heaven, and that you have to confess your sins to a priest and not Jesus directly? Oh. When you stop to think about it, these usurpations wouldn't deceive a child. And yet, they have deceived the whole world. And that after the Protestant Reformation, when light came into the world. The dark ages were destroyed by the light of the gospel and the proclamation of God's people. We have found the Antichrist right there in Rome. Nobody needs to doubt it. Could you paint a more gloomy picture? of God's house today so blind as to be incomprehensible. And trust me, we're not done with Martin Luther, and he's just the beginning. There are many other Protestant reformers who show their proofs in their own writings And the indictment against the papacy is watertight. Do not be deceived any longer. Come out of the great delusion. Know the subtleties of Satan. 
that he seeks to deceive God's people right there in the garden with us, right there in our own churches. And he's not only in the church, he owns it and everything that's taught in it. We have to pray. Pray like never before that God will restore the knowledge of who not only Christ is, but who Antichrist is. Only then will we know what the scriptures are revealing to us and the purpose that Christ has for our lives. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. Prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total loss.